coming into the halfway mark of the group stage, it's the current number one and number two in Group A. Deliberately offensive is visiting the weak prescriptions. Another day, another player who doesn't belong on the mound for the offensive, it's Jimmy Fox. He may not be as out of place as you would think. Jimmy absolutely dominated the league playing all over the field and ranking sixth all-time in OPS. And in the final year of his career at age 37, he said, yeah, pitching looks fun, I'ma try that. He made nine appearances, including two starts, racking up an ERA of 159. Let's see if it translates here. He's in trouble here in the first, with runners on first and third with one out, and Jim Bottomley at the plate. He sends a fly ball out to left. Will it be deep enough to bring home the run? No, an absolute cannonball from Babe Ruth and left to retire the side and keep the prescriptions off the board. We go to the bottom of the second. It wasn't a bad start for Jimmy Fox, but he didn't have the sharpest control. He walks Ray Durham here with one out, his third of the game. Gary Matthews makes it four walks. And Zeal makes him pay for those mistakes, dropping a little flare into center field and giving the prescriptions the one nothing lead. We go to the bottom of the third now. Mike Piazza's at the plate and I'm gonna channel Chris Berman here. Back, 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 gone! Rest in peace, Swami. That makes it two nothing prescriptions on Piazza's second home run of the year. Meanwhile, Emmett O'Neill is punching way above his weight class for the prescriptions. His career numbers on his resume here will tell you that he had no problem convincing us he belonged on the wildest team in the league. However, today he has seized the day and has kept the offensive scoreless through the first three innings, striking out six, and it looks like he's just getting started. He gets Babe Ruth to strike out. Mel Ott's looking, and Lou Gehrig flies out to end the fourth. O'Neill's having a career day. We jump to the bottom of the fifth. Here comes Ray Durham and, wait, wait, what? Chris Berman's still alive? That can't be, that can't be right. Let's fire up the old Google and, how is that, who was I thinking of? Anyway, good on you, Chris Berman. Good to hear that you're still sucking down air. So we go to the top of the sixth, and Ruth Sack Fly puts the deliberately offensive on the board and makes it three to one. Hornsby reaches after him, but worse fielders my ass. Mike Piazza guns him down, trying to steal second. John Madden. I, I, maybe I was thinking of John Madden. Offensive making some headway, but it's Jim Bottomley in the bottom of the sixth, and he gets it. Five one prescriptions. That'll take us to the top of the seventh. Here comes the offensive. Yount scores Ott on a fielder's choice. Pujols reaches on a double and wait a second. What do you mean John Madden is still alive? Mike Schmidt brings him home, but that hardly matters anymore. Who else is still alive? Uh, offensive cuts the lead to two, it's five to three. Evan O'Neill comes out in the eighth with the prescriptions up six to three and he put up quite the line. Seven innings pitch, struck out eight, only three runs given up to these elite hitters. In comes Mark Clear, and it's the prescription, so he's walked the bases loaded with a certain Barry Bonds at the plate. Oh, but he gets Barry swinging. And it's Charlie Geringer with the final chance of the inning to do some damage here late. And that's not going to get it done. Prescription's still up three, and in fact, they go on to win by the score of nine to five. So the prescriptions remain undefeated at three to nothing, and it's getting difficult to picture the playoffs without them. Offensive falls to one and two, and they'll need the 2019 Tigers to serve up a loss to the Turnpikes if they want to stay in playoff position. How about Ray Durham? Through three games, he's hitting over 700, knocking in four, including his second home run of the tourney. Meanwhile, the offensive may have had an identity crisis, walking 15, including eight served up by Jimmy Fox. The other player of the game, Modern Medicine. No one is presumed dead anymore. You find a corpse, you better poke it, boys and girls. Let's go to the next game. It's time for the fifth matchup in Group B, and it's a clash of winless teams. Glory Days have so far failed to recover their Glory Days, and the Big Bones are acting like Dolly Parton and are big busts. Well, something has to give as these 0-2 teams go at it. 
Glory Deeds are sending Dontrell Willis to the mound, who in their last game came off the bench to hit a double. Willis was actually a pretty good hitter for someone who made his living on the mound. In 2006, he became the first pitcher in four years to hit a grand slam, and he also had multi-homer games to add to his legacy. But for me, his biggest legacy is a Mandela effect shilling of Subway sandwiches. I'm convinced I remember him in Subway ads around 2005, but there is no evidence on the internet that this ever happened. Anyone who can find proof of this will earn Doug's merchandise once we have Doug's merchandise. Enough ramblings about overpriced sandwiches, though. To the top of the first, a Miguel Sano follows up his good outing last time with an RBI single for his fifth of the season, and the big bones are on the board. The lead wouldn't last long, however, as Jerome Walton blasts a game-tying homer in the third. Walton was Rookie of the Year for the Cubs in 1989, yet you can buy his 1989 Upper Deck Rookie card for a mere 50 cents on eBay. I'm sure that home run added at least a nickel to the price, though. To the top of the fourth we go now, Willis is cruising, but it's human centipede time. Miguel Sano is first, Dimitri Young behind him, and Kyle Blanks bringing up the rear of this three-in-a-row horror show for Dontrell Willis. It's 4-1 to the big boats. The Glory Days do not let the trauma of watching that affect them. They need a big comeback. For Walt Disney, it was Beauty and the Beast. For Walt Droppo, it's a beauty of a swing and a beast of a drive, to make it 4-3. Walton, whose rookie card now must be worth a dollar, ties the game with an RBI single. And that gives Willis the chance to give the Glory Days the lead. Willis is one of those players who seems to prefer swinging the bat, but is annoyingly better on the mound, and tolerates pitching as long as he gets a chance to take a hack every now and then. He gleefully singles here to give his team a 5-4 advantage. Into the fifth now, and Eric Hinsky hits a three-run home run. And if it was anyone else, we'd talk about the play, but it's Eric Hinsky, and we finally have a chance to bring up his massive back tattoo, featuring a man in a purple robe trying to rip apart a snake by pulling the serpent's jaws apart. It's an epic piece that not only encourages proper form when fighting a 20-foot snake, but also reminds us that being stuck on a winless Glory Days team is nowhere close to the worst pain than Ski has endured. Top of the synth, and the man who may or may not want you to eat fresh is recovering. You hit back to back to back home runs on me, I'll hit back to back to back strikeouts on you. Sano? Ha no! Young up? Rung up! Blanks? No thanks! So Willis redeems himself and we can go to the ninth. He's still on the mound, he's struck out a dozen, and the score is still 8-4. But then Dimitri Young hits a double, and Kyle Blanks takes one for the team, so the Glory Days management decide even poorly rendered computer sprites get tired, and take Don Trail out after 128 pitches. Rigetti comes in, and after an error, loads the bases. Rigetti acts like he's trying to drum up business for his new nightclub, and starts issuing free passes everywhere. First, Aguilar gets an RBI for just showing up to the plate, then Eldred makes it 8-6 without taking the bat off his shoulder. But Rigetti's no slouch, he was the first player ever to pitch a no-hitter and lead the league in saves in the same season, and he summons that spirit of 1983 to get Carlos Lee to fly out. The game is now on the very broad shoulders of Bill Boyd, and despite being dead for over a century, he has the chance to write his name into the history books, to become a Big Bones legend, to... No, never mind, he grounds into a fielder's choice, and the game is over. So, Dontrell gets the win, going eight and a third innings, and the Glory Days finally have a victory. On the other side of a coin, Miguel Sano is carrying the load for the big bones, and that's a mighty big load as these hefty hitters have waddled to an 0-3 record. Just like their shoelaces, the playoffs seem out of reach. Going back to Group A, the 2019 Detroit Tigers are trying to get into the win column, while the New Jersey Turnpikes look to take advantage of the deliberately offensive's loss to the weak prescriptions and slide into the halfway point of the group stage in playoff position. Vita Blue makes the start for the Turnpikes. For the Doug's purposes, he also doubles as a scout and a recruiter for the team as Jerry Martin in today in right field and Willie Aikens in at first base were busted for cocaine whilst being part of Vita's circle of hearty enthusiasts. Fortunately for the Turnpikes, he's also a Cy Young winner and a seven-time All-Star. Let's see what he's got today. Bottom of the first, and the Turnpikes are looking to get something started when Pierce Chile sends a liner into the gap. It's a no-doubter double, but Pierce is thinking three. Here's the throw, and he's out! 
You cannot trust a sign stealer to not attempt to steal an extra base and his sticky fingers here results in a toot blam. Bottom of the third and remembering how stupid Pierce Chiles looked, the turnpikes are looking for a more fundamental approach. Vita Blue bunts Charlie Hoover over to second and it's Ron LaFlore singling to bring Hoover home and opening the scoring at one nothing turnpikes. It's the bottom of the fifth and we have ourselves a pitcher's duel. That one run in the third has been the only tally thus far, and the Tigers' Daniel Norris continues to look solid. He strikes out Gates Brown. Hoover living up to his name in son... no, too obvious. Let's go with J. Edgar here. Living up to his name and looking like a former government agent with no baseball experience. Vita Blue is also no problem. Norris strikes out the side. Norris in a bit of trouble in the bottom of the sixth, and it's Vita Blue's buddy Jerry Martin at the plate with runners at first and second with two down, looking for some crucial insurance runs here. Oh, and he goes down swinging. Now, I'm not suggesting that Martin might be bitter about Blue getting him into the party lifestyle, but I'm pretty sure the replay will confirm that he had his eyes closed during that swing. Let's take a look. Yep, the camera doesn't lie. Bottom of the seventh now, and Gates Brown gives the Turnpikes another fantastic opportunity with a one-out triple. Next up, it's Charlie Hoover, and I hope he does something here, as I can only resist a suck pun so long. That's a two-run shot. Much like the Hoover Dam, Charlie Hoover is proving to be a useful tool to his team and community. Sheffield adds another RBI before the inning is through and the Turnpikes finally make the game a bit more comfortable at 4-0. Coming into the 8th, Vita Blue has struck out 9 and only given up 2 hits, but Kristen Stewart greets him in the top of the 8th with a solo shot to make it 4-1. But that's all the Tigers are going to get in the 8th and we go to the 9th with the Turnpikes still leading by 3. Saves situation, so it's K-Rod back on the mound after closing down game one against deliberately offensive. One down already, and here's Ronnie Rodriguez. Uh-oh. It's not going to be a smooth save this time, as that home run makes it 4-2. to two. A two-run deficit in the ninth feels like an absolute windfall to this terrible team, so if the Tigers were aquatic, I'm sure they'd be smelling blood in the water. Miguel Cabrera takes a one-out walk, so that'll bring the tying run to the plate. That brings up Jacoby Jones, and he flies out, so last chance for the Tigers and Brandon Dixon. And he strikes out looking. The Tigers fail to record their first win, and the Turnpikes leapfrog deliberately offensive to occupy the second playoff slot in Group A. Vita Blue absolutely shut the Tigers down, wrapping up the game with 10 Ks against only two walks and giving up a single run. They spoiled that nice start out of Daniel Norris, who, to his credit, only gave up three earned runs over seven, striking out eight. This is the big one, folks. That's why you subscribe to the Ducks. It's the battle of the unbeatens as the boys from Britain, the Union Jacks, travel to the Bronx to take on the Banana Fanas. There's not 32,000 ships in New York Harbor for this war, but both the Banana Fananas and the Union Union Jacks have their right-hand man, as two elite righties take them out. Banana Fananas start Orville Overall, the man who started five World Series games for the Chicago Cubs but has clearly never pitched in a more important game than this one. The Union Jacks counter with Welshman Ted Lewis, a fascinating man who retired from the game at 28 to enter academia and became the president of Massachusetts Agricultural College. Their official website notes he was fired for being too liberal. And while they don't go into detail as to what that means, remember, he was Welsh at an agricultural school. The action starts in the top of the first as the Jacks are using their brain. Dave hits a two-out, two-run homer and the visitors strike first. Banana Fananas have a chance in the bottom of the first as Kunt shakes off the rust with a single. Padden is trying to come home and tests Tom Brown's arm. This is a good idea, as Brown is a man who is lucky he was born in Liverpool and gets to play for the Union Jacks, because his 490 career errors would make him an ideal player for Group A's weak prescriptions. Incredibly though, he not only feels this cleanly, he throws out Padden and Lewis escapes the inning. Into the fourth and Brain, whose Wikipedia page rather rudely leads off with Brain was unreliable, is having a good day. He steals second and Dick Higgum drives him home on the left side of the road. George Hall, like Higgum, was banned from baseball for gambling, so you have to wonder how much the pair made on this play as one scores the other. It's 4 nothing and into the bottom of the fifth, where Pete Lecoq is crowing on first. This was their first hit since the first inning, so finally a chance for Banana Fananas to get back into it. But first, Liberal Ted Lewis strikes out Shooty Babbitt, then tells his way to no pickles, 
and Dilafour grounds into a double play. The Union Jacks aren't showing any mercy. He is a 447 foot solo shot from George Hall in the 7th, quickly followed by another in the 8th by the man who committed the first error ever in a World Series, Hope Ferris. Don't worry Hope, no one remembers. Frankly, this game didn't live up to the pre-game hype. It was a stroll for the Redcoats as they shut out the Banana Fananas 6-0. Ted Lewis was in rare bit form as the Welshman threw a complete game shutout. The classic pairing of Dick and Kuntz combined for five of the six hits against Lewis, but they find themselves on the losing team for the first time this season. The Union Jacks are undefeated and top the Group B table, and so are the weak prescriptions over in Johnny Paprika's Group A. Next time out, we'll be bringing you two massive third versus second games. Johnny will talk you through the rematch between the Turnpikes and Offensive as those teams battle for a playoff spot, and I'll be back with today's losers for Manana Fananas at Glory Days. Until then, do all the things you normally do with videos you like. I've been Hamish Hamden, and the Dugs are closed. <laughs>